All right. Hello and welcome everyone to BC Sandpile. Today I'm really excited because we have a new guest who hasn't been uh, a presenter or a panelist on, on the show yet. And that is Scott Scheffler, um, a co-founder at Chicago Digital, uh, my business partner, and um, our, I would say, um, most talented developer here at Business Catalyst and the one who has a lot of the knowledge um, that, um, you know, as a, as a group here at Chicago Digital, um, you know, oftentimes stems from, uh, from something Scott has worked on or, or, or helped another developer with. So really excited to have him uh, join us today. And uh, the reason why we don't uh, see Dave with us today is although he is Canadian and doesn't celebrate um, American Thanksgiving, he's taking off for his own, I guess, uh, Thanksgiving or family time, whatever it may be. And so um, Scott's filling in. And, and speaking of Thanksgiving, and we all know that Black Friday is a, is a big shopping day, Cyber Monday, also a big shopping day around that Thanksgiving time. And, and so uh, Thrize, uh, one of the developers for the, on the BC Apps Store is going to be having a really big sale uh, all weekend long and there'll be some details being sent out uh, via email, but I, th I believe Thursday at midnight, uh, this will be US time, uh, through through uh, Monday, uh, all of the Thrize apps are going to be 25% off. Awesome. So for some other industry news, uh, we have, let me go ahead and share my screen here with you quick. Oh, man. Usually Dave shares his screen. There we go. Cool. So you guys can see BC Academy? Awesome. Um, so speaking of Dave, uh, Dave has a new tutorial on BC Academy talking about how to build responsive blog layouts. And one of the great things about this uh, tutorial is if you are wanting to get a sneak peek at the new e-commerce template over at BC Gurus, uh, the Arrowware, this would be, uh, this tutorial has, uh, ha has a sneak peek contained in it. Uh, which, which is great. And then also, uh, the previous week, Scott had come out with a site search enhancements tutorial, which gets around some of the kind of annoying things that happen as, as part of the BC search. So Scott, I'll hand it over to you to talk about, you know, so what the reasons why um, you created this and, and what you accomplished with the, with the tutorial. Sure. Would it be easier to share my screen? Sure. All right. Let's see if I can do that. I don't know which screen. Can you see uh, the IACC website? No, the I Chicago Digital Background. Okay. Wrong monitor. All right. How about that? Yep. All right. So this is one of our sites that just has the regular search results implemented. Um, and you'll notice that if I click on like one of these, it kind of takes us to this default ASPX with um, some parameters appended. So first off, that's not really a very clean URL, especially if someone wants to maybe then search and then share this URL with somebody else. Um, so some of the enhancements that we made are, we'll take a look at the Brain Injury Association of America site, um, is that first off, we have clean URLs when you perform a site search. So if I do a search, let's just do brain injury. Um, you'll notice that uh, if I click on a page, it actually takes me to a clean URL. Um, and then another thing is you'll notice that we have some labels on our search results as well. So it tells me that it's a page or that it's a part of the web app media center um, or it's part of the web app called public policy. So it just gives a little bit more information to the user as well. And then another big thing is too, I don't know if a lot of you have come across this, but if you have liquid on your pages, um, and it's like the first thing on your page, then search results in BC are showing that raw liquid code. So this is a bug that BC is aware of. I don't know when it's going to get fixed, um, but this sh um, tutorial shows you a workaround to get rid of that liquid markup in the search results. Um, so check out that tutorial uh, if you wanna learn more. Awesome, thanks Scott. All right, so now heading into the topic today, which is gonna be talking about open graph tags on Business Catalyst. And so open graph tags is the kind of the meta tags that Facebook uses in order for us as developers and owners of sites to control 
uh, or, or suggests to Facebook the information that it should use when it shares, uh, you know, when users share our websites and our pages um, on, on the social media platforms. Uh, the conversation today will also extend into, you know, Twitter cards and also schema.org markup in general, because all of these things have to do with the concept of providing additional meta data to a third party so that they can better understand and, and present our information. So to, to get started with it, I just, I'll present a, a question to Scott, and that is, um, you know, what, what do you find to be kind of the most challenging part of, of working with these tags on, on Business Catalyst uh, websites? Um, I, I don't know if there's necessarily anything challenging. I feel like there's the most challenging maybe is, you know, where to place them, um, you know, in web app detail layouts. Uh, and there's some, you know, I think on product detail layouts, you need to wrap it in like a, <clears throat> in the head elements. Otherwise it won't get pushed up to the top of the page. So I think kind of just once you learn some of those little, you know, tweaks that you need to make in BC, um, I, I think that's pretty much the only challenging thing. There are some times where if you need to run if conditional logic with liquid, you know, maybe you, you want to detect if there is an image, if not fall back to another image, you, you actually can't wrap liquid around meta tags. You have to do it within the content parameter. So there's just some things like that, that kind of just have to get used to. Got it. Um, to me, I think one of the biggest challenges with, uh, with these tags and business catalyst is, is not with web apps. Cause I think you're right. Web apps is, you know, maybe there's some nuances to it or, you know, some things you got to figure out, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to understand. We're going to add some, maybe some custom fields and the customer can put in that and define that information and we can put in some fallbacks. But for regular web pages, there's not an interface for the client to actually put that information in. And a lot of times, you know, it's, it's pretty t tall order to ask a client to go look up the Facebook documentation, Twitter documentation, et cetera, and put that into, <coughs> into a web page. Um, so I know at Chicago Digital, the way that we get around that is we kind of have a paid a web app item associated with every page and automatically connect those. And we call that page control. And then in that page control web app item, we put in all of those fields so that the customer can easily add on to it. But I think without doing that web app item and that page control, Scott, have we, have we found a way uh, to make it easy for clients to insert that data? Or is that, is that the recommended solution? Uh, for people who want to give their clients the ability to define those things um, for for web pages, yeah, I, I think page control or something similar to that is probably your best bet. Um, there's really no good way, considering when you just put in the uh, meta or page title and description, it just inserts those meta tags and description into the actual body of the WYSIWYG editor. Um, so you really don't have much control that I could think of. I mean, perhaps, um, yeah. So probably a web app is the best route. Okay, great. And then just for, for those out there that aren't familiar with page and call, think about it as a, in, in the simplest sense is just a web app item with the same exact name as the page and using liquid to match that item and then to pull data from the web app into the page to get around the limitation of only having like one fields to be able to put information um, for business catalyst pages. So it definitely takes a little bit more to set up. Uh, you know, we, we've provided some various training to believe on, on how to make that even easier um, and kind of plug and play. But that, I mean, that's really the solution that we found in order, order to, to make that something that the client can actually update. Awesome. So Scott, when let's talk about Facebook open graph uh, in particular, what, if someone's going to look to implement this on, on their site, um, what are, are there any tools out there um, that can help a developer to understand how to like, how to even go about installing this on, on the website? Um, I mean, just a simple Google search for open graph protocol. I, I mean, this is, this is one good, good one. I'll just post or paste into the, the chat window. Um, I mean, that gives you a bunch of the different uh, open graph tags. Um, and then, you know, using the Facebook debugger um, is always good too. Once you get those tags in there, just to make sure that's 
um, the content is showing up correctly and that there's no errors. Um, and then another good thing to know about the debugger is I think it like clears the, the kind of like the cache, I would say, of these um, open graph tags. Sometimes um, Facebook will cache them like an, like a, like the page without an image or without the title or description. And then you kind of have to um, come in here and, and put in that URL and then it kind of caches or clears that cache. And then you can actually see the, the new image or the new the title or description. Got so. it. So you can force... Facebook to re-index, to re-cache uh, the, the page, right? Yeah, correct. Got it. Because I know this has come up a couple times with, with clients where we tell them, all right, you know, you, got, you have this ability to go in and put this image and update the title and things like that. And they go and they do that right away, you know, even if the site's live and they update the information and they go to share it right away on Facebook and be like, it's not working properly. And then we've got to coach them into saying, okay, Facebook can't crawl every website across, you know, the, you know, it doesn't pull all that like the exact second that you update it. And every time someone shares with it, cause that's a lot of extra uh, kind of load and, and bandwidth. And so it keeps its own cache. And so, you know, I, I don't know, do we know what the, the Facebook cache amount of time is or does it vary? Yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Got it. But I, I have told clients in the past, um, if they are really concerned about it or want to get that kind of announcement out right away, um, anyone can go to that Facebook uh, debugger tool and, and put in the page and force uh, the you know, Facebook to grab the latest bit of information um, from, from the page. So that, that is helpful to let certain clients know about. Okay, great. So Scott, what about, uh, what about Twitter? Any, any good resources um, for implementing Twitter cards, uh, debuggers? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't really have a specific resource. Just uh, Twitter's documentation website will explain it pretty much in depth. Um, and I don't, I don't know if they have a debugger. I, I haven't come across one. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Okay, and then any, any nuances with, with Twitter that you've run across um, that – you know, it isn't obvious in, in the documentation in, in terms of implementing these? Like if, for example, if you don't put in an image, does it just like not work at all? Honestly, I haven't done a lot of testing with the Twitter tag, so I, I can't say one way or another. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, maybe someone else out there in the community has done more testing with these Twitter tags. I kind of just put them in routinely, but really haven't done a whole lot of testing or clients really haven't you know, requested us to make sure that they uh, they're they're looking good and everything, so I don't know. Right, it, and I feel like Twitter these days isn't quite as popular anymore, or said a different way, we don't really hear it um, from our clients as much as we used to in terms of you know making making sure things um, are, are are easily tweetable and uh, and shareable via via Twitter. Um, not saying that it's not important. Uh, definitely, definitely still has its its place. Um, good. All right. So then Scott, I don't know if you want to share your screen or, uh, we can just talk to it, but you kind of mentioned before some of the, the, the gotchas with implementing this on, on business catalyst, uh, maybe such as you can't wrap liquid, you know, meta tags and liquid. Maybe you just want to start there and, and go into a little bit more detail on, on what that means for someone who has maybe not attempt this before and, and might run across this problem. Sure. Um, let me, let me just find one, uh, web app as an example. Good. And then, um, Mary had, has commented, I tried and failed to implement Twitter tags on a site. I'm sure we all have at some point for sure. Uh, Mary, if there's any, uh, a particular question or a challenge that you had in that implementation, um, that we can, we can try to answer or help with, uh, we would love to love to have that opportunity i you know scott has has successfully implemented this on on many sites um so we can we can kind of peel back the curtain if needed and, and look at some of the code as well all right so can you see my screen mike yeah all right i'll just clear this up all right so this is kind of, this is a web app detail this is for a news web app on the bia website that i was showing earlier um, and you'll notice that starting with our title tag up here, um, the title tag is obviously a little bit different because there's, you just put it in between the, the opening and closing title tag. 
Um, so you can put liquid in here and you'll notice that we have in our web app field a SEO page title, title field. Um, and then we have a fallback. So we're doing if condition, if the SEO page title does not equal an empty value, then I'll put that else. We're just going to output the page title, the name of the web app item. And you'll notice that I'm just adding some filters just to be extra safe. Um, just in case the client puts in any HTML, which they shouldn't, um, or there's any white space, I'm using some filters to kind of strip out any of that information. Um, and then getting down to our actual um, open graph tags and it's kind of our social media tags right here, um, you'll notice that uh, it's also important to make sure that you put in the escape um, in case any of your uh, titles or names have um, uh, uh, quotations. Um, usually, you know, it won't really cause any issues, but it might give you some syntax errors because, you know, obviously if I put in a quote, a double quote here, it's going to mess up my code, code because I have more than one opening and closing quote. So the escape will escape any of those unwanted characters in your meta um, tags. Um, and then, <clears throat> um, so here's one where I have an if if condition statement within the content property of my description. So like I was saying before, if you did something like this, then uh, let me just sorry, I'm trying to do this quickly. Then this is not this is not going to work because um, what basically BC render is, is like detects these tags and moves them up to the head of the body before. Um, any of this liquid is rendered. So it's important to make sure that you put this liquid within the content property. Um, and it, it might cause a, uh, some like warnings or your HTML markup, you might lose some of that color coding because it doesn't really like having that in there, but it still works. So just keep that in mind. And uh, yes, and then again, you'll notice that we use fallbacks often. So if we have a, we supply the client with an SEO meta description, but if they don't put that in, then we'll fall back to a just using the description field and then again applying some filters to make sure we're stripping out any HTML and you know truncating it and then escaping it to get rid of any unwanted characters. Great. Thanks for showing this guy. And I want to highlight a, a couple of things here for people. One is I, I love the the escape because that that just makes this more robust and you know sure that something's not going to break or you know we've got these weird characters that are going to be outputted. Um, in, in some of these areas. So I think that's, that's really important to highlight, um, as you mentioned. Uh, the other thing is in this SEO meta description, you're stripping HTML and then stripping white space and escaping. So all three of those things combined, making sure that we, re like we just have plain text output um, when, we're, when we're putting things in there, which, is, uh, which I think is really important as well. And then another thing to keep in mind, guys, is if you don't specify this for Facebook or Twitter, um, it's going to come up with what it thinks is the best. So if I tweet this entire page, it might pull the text at the top of the website that has nothing to really do with the page. Um, and it, like it, it, it might not really be a great introductory text to get anyone excited about, about clicking over to it. So what what Scott is showing here is some fallbacks, meaning, okay, we don't have to rely on the customer to give us the exact crafted uh, description that we need for Twitter and Facebook. Um, it's great if they do, but if they don't, we can come up, we can find what we think is going to be the best place to pull from. And we're going to know better than, you know, Facebook or, or Twitter necessarily, you know, you know, when they're just scanning the entire page, we'll know like, okay, this overview or this description or this caption, whatever um, is, is the most appropriate to use as, as, as a fallback. Um, so I think that's another important point that I want to um, show here uh, as well. So I don't think we're using fallbacks um, for Facebook or Twitter, it doesn't look like, uh, but we are using it for the meta description. But Scott, uh, we'd be able to apply fallbacks to those descriptions we wanted to, right, for Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, I think there was a specific reason on this site why we don't have a fallback on this one, but I, I can't, I don't recall exactly why we aren't using a fallback in this situation, but we, we definitely could. Okay, good. yeah, good to know. And then we're also truncating as well because uh, Facebook likes a different character count than Twitter. 
uh, for example. So using liquid, we, there's that function uh, truncate I see there where you can specify the number of characters um, that, that we can put in there. And, and what happens, Scott, when, when it truncates? Does it put an ellipsis, like the three dots in there? Um, does it cut it off by characters or words? Uh, what, what are the options that people have if they're wanting to auto truncate text in, in Business Catalyst? Yeah, I think by default it does um, put the ellipsis, but if you wanted to um, overwrite the ellipsis, I think you can do something. If you just do like an empty, do like a comma and then an empty value, I don't think it'll put an ellipsis then. Which might be good because uh, I could be mistaken. We will have to, we might look is Facebook or Twitter, these other sources might automatically put an ellipsis on their side if, you know, the content gets cut off. And so then you would, you may not want like a double ellipsis, you don't want three dots, you know, or six dots in a row, you know, in, in that sort of case. I don't know if that is the case or not, but I uh, just I appreciate you pointing that out that uh, possibility in, in case people do come across that. Great. Uh, let's see, any, any questions from, from the live audience here on um, this implementation that we have here? This, again, we're looking at a detailed page of a web app. In this case, you know, think of it as a, a bio or a blog post or, in this case, you know, a, a state, a listing of uh, locations, uh, for example. Or in the case of page control, that's a web app item. This is what we're rendering per page, and we're just mapping, automatically linking the the web app item, the page web app item with the actual like page in Business Catalyst and then the, um, the implementation is the same. Uh, Scott, is there anything different that you would need to do if this web app was not actually a web app but was the page control that's linking with a page or is the, the implementation uh, the same? If this is just a regular web page, you mean? Yeah, if this was a web page and we are linking it to a web app via, uh, you know, via like a page control web app. Um, is there anything different that we need to to do or is it um, pretty much the same thing? Well, I, I could show you how we have it set up. So here on the site, we have page control and then in page control, um, some of our fields are social image, meta social title and meta social description. Um, and then um, in one of our page control layouts, so this would go on in the head of the document um, after we're calling our page control and have, you know, um, found the page that we're on or the template we're on, then this is where we are um, putting in those for so regular pages. So if, you know, some for, uh, so if I just go to like about brain injury, I just navigate it away. But if I'm on about brain and injury, and this is just a regular page, then people can come in here and put in their image, their title and their description, and then that'll show up on a regular page. Okay, excellent. So it looks like the, it's basically the same thing, but just from a kind of organization standpoint, uh, when you implemented it, uh, you, can, you kind of broke out the include files to just have the, the social media stuff uh, separated. But ultimately, it gets pulled in and renders you know, the, 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 same, the same sort of thing. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So what we're looking at here on the screen is... This is the overall, this is the head, kind of our master head of, of all of our pages on the site, whether it's a, a page and, or web app, or is this strictly for regular web pages? Scott, this, is for the, this is the head of the entire website. Okay. So we're looking at a lot of different icons, you know, for yeah, these are just Microsoft all the different applications, accounts. Apple, et cetera. Okay. Some fonts, CSS. Um, great. And then... Where, where do we reference the, the meta tags? So I see some meta, okay, go. So, so it, starts, it starts with the, the page control. So once we have identified our page control and we also have company settings and then we're, I'm specifying just some site wide, you know, open graph tags and stuff like this because this is not going to change per page. Got so it. We're putting in like the company name and the current page that you're on um, and this will work regardless where you are um, and then the fate, you're obviously your, the company Facebook page is not going to change and same with the Twitter handle. And then here is where we're starting our, our meta text fi uh, TPL file, which I just showed you right here. Whereas when you put those into the individual page control items, then you can specify, specify them per page. Got it. Okay. And can you go back to that, the head document again? Uh, one of the things I really like about this implementation too, is that 
it's hooked up with the solid company settings. And in that solid company settings, I think you've modified it to ask for the Facebook page and Twitter handle. And then you've got if statements in here that detects whether or not the, the customer has given us that information. And if we don't have the information, then we're not, you know, we're not going to you know, output empty tags. Um, so we only get it if, if that information is provided, which is nice. Yeah. And just again, to restate why I have liquid logic wrapped around the meta tags in this example is because we're already in the head of our document. So BC doesn't have to move these tags up to the head of the document. They're already in here. So then you can use liquid in this case. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad you clarified that because that, that is, that is confusing. Let, let's go through that kind of one more time. So here in the head of the document, it's okay because because if the uh, uh, business catalyst knows how to run these if statements in the head of the document, but then when you put this in like a web app detail view, business catalyst strips, like finds all the meta tags and strips them out and puts them in the head and, and like uh, it doesn't bring the, the liquid logic with it. Um, uh, maybe I'm not saying that the best way, but I yeah, think that's, I mean, I think essentially if you're in the web app detail, what BC is going to do is it's going to find this meta tag and then it's going to move it up to the head of the document and kind of essentially leaving the liquid there and it moves it Got before it. this actually gets execu executed. Got it. Okay. And we can't put, we couldn't put that whole meta property into, let's say a capture of liquid, right? And out, and then output that liquid variable because then business catalyst wouldn't detect that that liquid variable is a meta tag and therefore wouldn't place it into the head of the document. So we need, we need those meta variables exposed kind of just naturally if we're ever placing it in a, a web app detail view in order for business catalyst to automatically pop it into the head of the document. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and so everything that we've talked about here for Facebook and, and Twitter does the same apply for, for uh, schema.org rich snippet markup tags? Um, so I've been using the, the JSON version of schema as of late. It just seems easier to implement to get all the data you need without having to actually, you know, output it in a, in a layout that's, you know, shown to the user. I mean, obviously you want, you don't want to be outputting just some random data that isn't, relevant, but it's, there's sometimes, you know, formatting of dates or, or things like that, that um, you don't necessarily want to get output and it's just easier to put in a JSON version. Um, so I, I guess I could show uh, yeah. an example. So this is a website we actually just took live today called Cleaning and Maintenance Management. They are a magazine, uh, cleaning magazine publication site. Um, and they have a lot of articles and they put out a magazine um, every month or so, I think, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think 10 of them a year, eight or 10. Cool, and then, so yeah, let's just go to an article and let me just recall where I put this. Okay, so on the bottom of my article detail page, and I also have this in the list view as well, but I have um, the include file for schema, which is just referencing another layout, kind of just to organize it better, um, that houses my, my schema markup. So if I go to module templates, web apps, articles, and schema, this is where I have my markup uh, my schema markup in JSON format for my article. Um, and so again, I'm using liquid and if condition statements, if, you know, for example, if, you know, there is no video, then I'm not going to put the embed URL. Um, and all this kind of like information of this, what, you know, markup properties to put can all be found on in Google's documentation. I usually start at Google's documentation just because uh, I know that's what Google likes and, you know, obviously Google is the most important to satisfy. So that's where I'll start, but there's also like schema.org where you can get a lot of the, these properties as well to mark up uh, specific types of media like articles um, or events or, or concerts or whatever you have on your website. So Scott, 
you've got this separate file that outputs this this schema uh, JSON, which is which is great, and uh, I, I like how it you know, is very organized um, and and and, kind of, and separated. But help me understand and, and help everyone understand how do you get the data from the web app and the page that we're going to need in order to find these things? How, how do you get that passed through to this file? Well, the nice thing about using include files is that, you know, everything passes through them. So I'm just, this is my article, my web app article detail page. So any data that I can get on my article detail page, um, you know, like you'll see my, my, my well, that's, that's actually something else, but um, if I actually have some content, so this is a really <laughs> big detail layout. So like, for example, my release date on my article detail, like any of that information I can pass into this include file. And I mean, I could put this schema markup on my article detail. I was just kind of doing this from an organization standpoint to kind of yeah. separate this out and not make this any longer because you can already see this is like a massive web app detail layout. So um, yeah, okay. so yeah, if, if I'm understanding correctly, any liquid variable that you've defined in the um, in the web app detail view, you're able to use in that TPL file. Um, is that correct? Correct. And I'm also, another reason why I have this in a TPL file is because I'm using the same schema markup on the list view as well. So I'm on the detail. So I, it's using, it uses like this because I'm in the context of the detail layout. But if you're on a list layout, you, it might be item. So I'm specifying, uh. I'm specifying the, the kind of like the handle. I think I'm not really sure what you call the prepended item or the, I guess in the, in the loop of the collection, it's the, the, the collection name or whatever. But so okay. it, in a list, in a list view it would be item dot, you know, name, but in a detail view, it would be name or if there's spaces, it'd be this dot right. know, name. So that's why I'm specifying that there. And then um, I can use that one in, uh, schema TPL include file for both the list and the detail layout. Yeah, wow, that's really smart uh, to be able to reuse that that same file then. Awesome. So we had a question come in here from James. He says, so what does the schema do? Is there another service that scrapes these? And, and the answer is yes, it's Google. Uh, the person... Uh, the company we arguably care about the most, right? So we were trying to help Google understand um, what the content is structurally on, on our website. So Scott's showing right here, he's going to put in this article into the structured data testing tool. And cross my Google. fingers, there's no errors. <laughs> and yeah, let's hope there's no errors. Good. That's no. not. So what we're, what we're saying here, or what Google is seeing is, Scott, go back for a second. On the, on the screen, click the back arrow next to, no, 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 oh, not that one, sorry, the organization one. Um, cool, so Google is seeing, based on the, the structured data markup that Scott has coded this page with, it recognizes three types of objects. It recognizes the organization, it, it recognizes an article, and two articles actually, and then it recognizes a person. So then when we dig into it, each article, it now knows very clearly that this is the headline, this is the image, this is the, um, the day created, modified. So Google doesn't have to guess at these things, we're, we're providing it. It's, it's almost like if there was an HTML tag for every single one of these, then Google would be able to just like read the code and know that, but there isn't an HTML tag specifically for every one of these things. So that's why we're, we're providing that extra level of granularity uh, to help Google understand the context of the page better. And say, so same thing with person, uh, we know the author and the organization. So this is really helpful uh, for search engine optimization. Um, and I would also say, I don't know this as a matter of fact, Scott, but I, I, the, the uh, schema.org is, a, is a, a shared standard. Like there's other companies that pull from it as well, probably Bing. And then I don't know, but I think if Facebook and Twitter, if you don't provide the specific information, it may look to this information to pull from information if it feels like it doesn't grab, if there's not, you know, so, something obvious that it should grab from on the page. But I'm not, I'm not very confident about that Facebook or, or Twitter part. Scott, do you know if, in, if we didn't include the open graph and the Twitter cards, if those sources would, would pull from this data at all? Uh, I, I don't know if, I don't, I wouldn't think so, but I'm not sure. 
I mean, obviously other search engines or other services might read schema, but I'm not sure if, if Facebook is, uses it as a fallback um, if the open graph tags are not supplied. I'm not sure. Great. So I don't know if there's any other questions from from the live audience here. Um, it could be related to to these topics that we that we've discussed. Uh, we can dig in deeper, show some more examples, uh, or if there's other kind of questions that generally relate to this topic, we're we're happy to uh, to field them as well. And if anyone has any um, input or kind of learning lessons or advice or um, knowledge uh, related to the topic they'd like to share with everyone, um, by all means, we'd we'd love to. We'd love to share that with everyone. Any anything else, Scott, from a open graph schema.org perspective that um, let's say, you know, someone who's new to business catalyst or new to the topic you would you want, you know, you you want to want them to know? Not that I could think of, but I'm open to, if anyone has any more specific questions, I can try to answer them. So I get another question for you, Scott, uh, as, as people are, are coming up with questions. And, and that is, you know, how, how long roughly do you think this, this adds to a project? And of course it varies depending on the size and complexity, but is this a is this a pretty straightforward you know kind of simple task or is this something that is is pretty involved and, and takes a lot of time and, and expertise? Kind of what's your gauge of that if someone's thinking about maybe incorporating this into a project? I mean, just open graph tags specifically, or yeah, schema or just schema. You can take them kind of one by one because I think open graph is probably simpler than the, than schema. But and I'll, I'll kind of let you. Um, give it your input on that. I mean, it's it's hard to give an answer on that just because you know you know just based on what I demoed, like you'll see, there's just so many variables and so many things to account for. So I mean, it all adds up to being a lot of time. But I mean, you know, if you're just going to get granular and ask how long it takes to you know add those meta tags to web app details, I mean, maybe I mean if you have a, you know save snippets and you're getting a routine of doing it not that much time, but, you know, it could add, you know, an additional 10 minutes per web app, I would maybe say. Uh, it's, it's really hard to give an answer on that, I guess. Sure. And do you think it's something that a, a kind of a, a junior developer is able to take care of or more of a senior developer role, or maybe you're maybe not even a developer, maybe just a marketing person that understands a little bit of coding? Yeah. I mean, I'm always a little concerned about giving anyone access to web app list layouts or detail layouts to add some of this, but I mean, there's really nothing difficult about adding it as long as you, you know, you, you know the, the syntax and you have the, the markup that you want to use and know um, how to use liquid to, to do the fallbacks. Um, it's rather straightforward. Got it. So if, if you've done it once, right, and then you want to put it onto another site or another web app, um, it was, is, is this an oversimplification in saying that you just you kind of copy your reference and then go and, and change out the variables to associate it with the, the new, the new web app. So, you know, if a team got their kind of code set, then they should be able to hand it off to maybe some, uh, more junior developers to implement, um, and kind of change out variables or is that, is that oversimplifying it? And there's, there's, there's more to it. Well, I mean, we pretty much stick with the same tags for every site, such as, you know, the open graph title tag, open graph description, an image, and same with the Twitter card. So it's pretty much copy and paste from web app to web app or from site to site. If, you know, the client has, uh, you know, if the client is, has like events or concerts, I know there's a lot of other open graph tags such as like, or music playlists where you can, where you can put in like the song that, of the music uh, or the album. So, I mean, if there's specific requirements like that, then there's a lot of other tags, but um, we keep it pretty straightforward unless there's a specific client request. Got it. That makes sense. And there was a, a question here that says, there's a lot to take on board. Do you have to cover every bit of data or are there any key things not to miss? And so I, I think the schema.org does outline what is required. 
And from my understanding of the, the testing tool, Scott, that Google provides, like if you don't provide one of the required fields, it's not going to listen to any of your data. So it's, it's not like, for example, if you're putting up products and you're not going to list the price, then you, you probably don't, it's probably not worth marking up the, the schema.org because it says, you know, it will error out and say, you know, price is required field. So I just got, I don't know if you've got any um, kind of experience or anything to add to that in terms of required mm -hmm. fields. Yeah, I would say that's a accurate statement. I don't know if they, I know it gives you an error, whether that error means it's not going to show anything. Uh, I'm not hundred percent positive on, but I, I know if you are missing any required fields, then it will give you an error um, and say that your markup is obviously inaccurate. Got it. So there are some optional ones that, you know, if are blank or not added, then they'll be fine. Right. But if you go to, if you go to Google developer like documentation, it tells you which ones are required. Okay, great. Then we have another, another question here uh, from Alexandra. I'm having problems with my blog article not showing up correctly. The big problem right now is getting the article title to show up correctly. The web app setup is way beyond my ability, so I probably won't uh, do it. So Scott, maybe if, I don't know if we've got a blog set up, but can you through the screen just share conceptually how you would implement this on the blog? And it's going to be relatively the same thing, but just to, to really show that example so that you, this doesn't only apply to web apps. You could use other BC modules like um, the blog to, to put these tags in as well. Yeah. Um, let me see here. So I, I can't think off the top of my head of a site that we've done with a blog recently, but if I go to the post, um, so this might be one of those layouts there's some layouts in BC that you need to put the opening and closing head tag. Web apps is not one of those. Web apps, it'll take, it'll find those meta tags um, and title tags and, and pop them up to the head. But in, I think maybe blogs might be one of those, um, you know, let me just get a visual here where you have to do something like this. And then obviously in your blog layouts, you know, you don't have custom fields, so you're going to have to use the, the built-in fields uh, for, well, blogs. And I can't really, I don't remember what it is right now, but it's probably just like. It, it might be like post title. Yeah. Or whatever. But, and so the, the tags that you see below, those are the legacy tags, uh, which you wouldn't really, you wouldn't use, you'd use the liquid equivalent of, which you can look up in the documentation. Uh, but you can do all of the same, you know, similar sort of uh, manipulations to the string on there. So you can escape it, you can strip out the HTML, uh, strip out the extra characters, et cetera. And, and so it looks like, yeah, Scott, this is a good example here of just simplifying the title and the, the uh, description or I guess the, the item prop name, the, so what is item prop name? Is that for a schema.org? Yeah, I think that's a schema thing, which I guess is a duplicate if I'm, if you're using schema elsewhere, but um, I think it's just an added thing to add. Um, I'm just looking up the. I think it's tags. layouts and tags. There you go. So if you go to the, the, the docs, you'll see all these uh, liquid tags. And I guess you could use the legacy ones as well. But, you know, this is the, the meta title one that you, that you put in. So you would do that, I guess. And then you could use the if else condition. If they don't specify a meta title, you could just have it uh, do the post title. And we can do the same thing here, Scott, with the with the open graph tags because we can pull automatically set the featured image in the blog module to the image in Facebook. We can automatically set the name to the name. We can automatically set like the description to a truncated version of the description. So everything that here that we did here with the web apps would, uh, would apply. Uh, we just would need to change out the reference, the variables to be things that are appropriate to the blog. Yep. So Alexandra, hopefully that, uh, answered your question and gave you some clarity around how you uh, would would approach that. If there's any other questions you have or, or about that, you know, let us know. Uh, a, a similar question for you, Scott. What is your current favorite 
sharing tool to install on websites. So if like you want a easy widget, a way for visitors to share the page on Facebook or Twitter or, or whatever, uh, Google Plus, if anyone does that anymore, uh, what, what's your what's your go-to tool for that? Yeah, I've been using Add This lately. Um, they've made a lot of updates as of recent and really improved um, kind of the types of configurations you can do and the look of the social media and sharing buttons. Um, you can do your own custom ones um, as well. So there's, there's a lot of uh, configuration you can do with those. So I've been liking that a lot. Great. So we have a request. Can you show a setup of how to add add this to a website? Hmm. What, Mike, can you recall a website that we have this on? I don't even know. If you know better than I do. Um, Delhi Direct, maybe? Well, actually, hold on. I think I can show like a custom example. On yeah, you member should have it on the article detail pages, I would think. Hmm. So this is a, a custom version of add this. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Not yet, no. Can you see it now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on the side right here, I have some custom add this buttons uh, that I configure just to, so I can style them myself and they kind of follow you down as you go down the article, which is nice. Uh, I like and then, that. And then if you click on them, it's just, you know, um, pulling up the add this, uh, you know, pop-up window so that I can post to Facebook and, and same with Twitter and LinkedIn. And then also it's using the add this email friend. So not all the add this ones pop up in a window, but it, they'll still use whatever um, kind of like their default uh, functionality is for sharing. Um, and let's see, I don't know. If, let's see how, let's see if I can, Take a look to see how I set this up. Sorry, this uh, Zoom bar is continuing to get in my way. That's why I keep having to minimize that. I was wondering. I, I was waiting for you to dock your your screens and do something. I don't know how to get rid of this Zoom bar, <laughs> but it keeps getting in the way of me clicking different tabs. Um. All right. Where, what was I doing? Uh, the custom add this implementation. Oh yeah. So here I have my sharing buttons, which is just my own custom markup. And then you can just append the class name to these things to kind of initiate or trigger that add this functionality for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, email. Um, and then I'm just, you just barely add this script to the, the layout or the template or wherever your add this code is. And then um, there's also some other variables that you can configure right, that I've done down here. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, obviously it takes some HTML and CSS styling um, and some JavaScript to get that sticky functionality that I demoed off, but uh, it's pretty much straightforward. And obviously okay, so you, Scott, you need to set up on add this as well. Go, going through that a little bit slower, uh, <laughs> pretending like I've never seen uh, an add this before. So let's, let's walk through what's happening here. So it requires an unordered list of well it doesn't require anything it, oh, okay this is my own markup the only thing that requ is required is this class name so this is a this you have to look up the add this documentation for the different services but essentially having this on your class will trigger the facebook um, add this pop-up window so that you can share it on facebook and same with twitter linkedin and their email okay so then the span with the class icon dash facebook dash f that's just our own doing in order to style it how we want or is that something that's related to add this nope the only thing that is related to add this is this class everything else is my own custom markup so this is using my, our font icons that we have on the site to give us that that facebook icon um and then you know i'm just i have a hashtag in here because uh, it's just obviously not actually using a url it's not supposed to go anywhere and then i'm using rel no foul just so 
it just gives like an added protection to tell, like if Google's indexing your site not to try to index this link. I don't think it would with a the hash symbol in there, but uh, just an, an added level of protection to tell Google not to index this link. Okay. Great. And do you have to have that href equals uh, a hash sign or is that? Um... Well, for proper, I think for proper markup, uh, okay. you need to have, an, like you can't have an a tag without an href. Got it. Okay. Great. And, and Steve Johnson has suggested that uh, you create a BC Academy tutorial about this, Scott. Which part? The, the whole custom part or is there something more specific? I don't know. Well, uh, Steve, let us know. Uh, just that he says, add this. Okay. I, there actually might be one. I don't know. Let's, let's check. Let's see. Add, add this social sharing widget to business catalyst. Add All right. Sharing on product detail pages. And social share meta tags for blogs, events, web apps. All right. So there, there might be a few things on there already, but if, if, one of these doesn't contain the information you're looking for, let us know. Cool. I like this homepage. Mm -hmm. Well, good. So I think we're going to, we'll wrap up the, sand pile for today everyone thank you so much for attending i hope you got uh some practical knowledge about the the topic that you guys can implement and and, and take forward to to your projects and your sites that you're working on uh currently and um we will uh, please join us next week uh for another topic uh let's see let's see what we're talking about next week um dave will be back with us to talk about Drum roll. Let's figure it out. Give me one second. A, B, page testing. Wow. What a topic. That's going to be fantastic. Um, that is something that we are really excited about at Chicago Digital is how websites can be used to, uh, you know, convert customer, you know, leads into customers or user you know, website visitors into leads, all of that and how we can continually do a better job of um, building sites and, and converting people and having a, a tool and being able to actually run experiments and, and figure out what's working is extremely important. So next week we'll be talking about how we can do that with Business Catalyst. So uh, please join us for that next week. And until then, uh, for those who are in the United States or just to people who like to celebrate United States holidays, um, you know, happy Thanksgiving to you guys and we'll see you next week.